I'm going to be bidding on this bad boy today. It's an A2 lower. A correct lower would be an A1, but there's very, very limited options for that. So I'm going to go with something that's not quite correct, but it's going to be pretty cool when I get it. So we already have the upper receiver done. And if you haven't seen the video on this, and if you want to, I'll go ahead and put a link in the description. So this is the top half, basically, of the M16 slash AR15. So what you saw just in the clip before online was the lower, which we'll need to get. And then once we get that, we'll made it to the upper. So originally there was residue for B43, and I kind of painstakingly traced them out and painted them. I don't know if I like that, because I don't think stickers would really get this dirty if they're vinyl or whatever they used, unless they use paper stickers, which I doubt they would be using a weapon. But So what my plan is, I'm going to get this paint off, kind of get it how it was, and then I ordered in the mail a 1970s, early 70s vintage sticker, so not a copy, a real sticker, so it'll be period correct. There we go. Pretty much back to how it was. Look who I'm chilling with. Hey, buddy. You picked a good day to stay inside, buddy. Yes, you did. Cause that's snow out there. So here is the vintage sticker Valvoline motor oil. This is what my dad and I, for the most part, have run on our vehicles ever since I was a little kid, and I'm sure he's done it for a long time too. It's pretty cool. It's from 1970. So the early 70s, which will be correct for the M16A1. Pretty sweet. There we go. I am very proud of how this turned out. No bubbles, nothing. So the sticker doesn't have a whole lot as far as moisture protection goes, but that's okay because as I use this, it's going to kind of wear in a little bit. I'm sure when this gun is complete, people are going to be asking, do you use Valvoline as the oil? And no, but close. I actually use this. I use synthetic motor oil for my guns. Save a lot of money and it works just as good. Check it out. We got the lower receiver. Isn't that awesome? Picked it up from my buddy who facilitated the transfer, Ortwine International. So if you're in West Michigan, and if you have any firearms related needs, go ahead and check them out. Check that out. Yeah. Hey buddy, look, look what I got. Look, check it out. It says restricted, restricted military government, law enforcement use only. How'd we get that then, buddy? How'd we get that? How'd we get that? Check it out. Let's we'll see it. No, I don't think it cares. So in case you're wondering, why is it marked this way and why do I have this? Well, this is old school. So between 1994 and 2004, the United States had the federal assault weapons ban. So anything made during that time that was not intended for civilian use, that had features that were restricted during that time, was marked in such a fashion to try to prevent people from obtaining that. So this one was a semi-automatic one, not a machine gun, but it did have features as a complete rifle that would have made it prohibited for private possession. That ban that they had had a sunset provision, meaning that when that law was in, in effect, part of it said we can automatically let this expire in 10 years because they weren't sure if it was going to help or not, and it didn't help. So, of course it didn't, right? Here's another example. It's pretty cool. 1094, it even references the actual October 1994, I believe. So anything made during that time that was not intended for civilian use had that. This one has it as well. It's kind of cool. Right now, it's really a collector thing. This doesn't mean anything anymore. Even back then, I've never heard of anyone actually getting convicted. It's one of those things where if you're in big trouble, if they're trying to throw a bunch of charges at you, they'll probably include it. This one says 1004, so that's referencing 2004. That's pretty cool. That makes sense since it was October 1994 to 2004. There's still a lot of goofy firearms out there that have limited or lack of features because they're made during that era. It was really weird. It basically took existing rifles and it took features off. At it, their cores, they were still the same rifles. So it was really basically a bunch of BS. But hey, that's what it is. If you're wondering why these markings are on that, that's why. A little history for you. Thankfully, it has expired. So we don't have to deal with that anymore. So this is an A2 lower receiver. And Cinnamon really couldn't care less, huh? <laughs> Want to check it out, buddy? Look. See? It's just a lower. Right now, it's, it's harmless. Yeah. But later in the video, it will not be harmless. <laughs> well, in our hands, it will be. Yeah, it'll be safe. Yes, it will. It's pretty cool. This is A2 lower, so it's not going to be correct for the A1 upper. But hey, it's a Colt lower. That's really what I was going for. So here's the markings there. Government carbine. Check it out, buddy. It's government carbine. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Has the Colt markings. That's more or less why I wanted it. Has the Colt markings. So you have safe, fire, 
Note there's no third position because this is a semi-automatic receiver. So when it's all assembled into a rifle, it will fire one shot per trigger pull. Yeah, not two, not three, not four, not 30, just one. So it's not a machine gun, but I know you wish it was. I do too. <laughs> These are some additional parts that will be captive once the stock assembly is installed. I gotta remove the grip too. That's an A2 style grip, of course, because it's an A2 receiver. I'm gonna put an A1 grip on there. You'll see that later. And then I also got some cool swag. Got some HK swag. Isn't that cool? And some rare Heckler & Koch chocolate direct from Germany, thanks to my buddy. Also got some Wine International swag. Got a cool coin. See the other side there? Look at that, like Spartan. That's cool. Carabiner. Patch. Looks pretty good with the Benz keys, huh? Check this out. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Remove before fight. We got some stickers. Fun stuff, huh? Isn't that cool, buddy? You get some water? Gotta stay hydrated. Yeah. Oh, you wanna go outside? Am I scaring you again? Okay. I put a link in the description to Ortwine International's website if you want to check them out for yourself. Dude, don't take my word for it. Yeah, isn't that right, buddy? You want to go outside? Is that what it is? Okay. So we have the parts laid out in the workbench here. We're not going to be needing the upper right now. We're going to assemble the lower, so we're just set this one aside for now. So you've probably noticed the upper that I just set aside is a long one. It's 20 inches. Now this lower says carbine on it, specifically government carbine. I did look up the definition of carbine online, so it's on the internet, it must be right. And it did say any barrel length up to 20 inches. So this is really barely qualifies as that, in my opinion, it's quite a stretch. In the world of ARs, a carbine is usually a 14 and a half inch to 16 inch barrel. But, you know, who cares? It's just a word, right? It's not a sticker or stone, so I think we'll be okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove this A2 style grip and install the A1 style. In order to do that, you need a flathead screwdriver and the added painter's tape is to make it a little bit thicker and you're going to see why we we'll want to do that in just a moment. You want to be a little careful because there's a detent in there. You don't want to lose any small parts. There's also a small spring that goes with the detent in the grip, so we're going to transfer the spring into the new grip. Just drops right in there real easy. We have it in the A1 style grip and then you just carefully make sure you don't kink this too and you reinstall it in the receiver. Just kind of have it mocked up. It's not installed yet. So the reason I had the tape to the end of the screwdriver is to retain this fastener a little bit better. And with this, you do not want to over torque this. So if you over torque this too much, you can strip out the aluminum threads inside of the receiver and you don't want to do that. So this is a steel fastener to the best of my knowledge. It appears to be stainless. So you want to be careful. You want to just get it in a little taunt. That was easy. So next we're going to install the stock. The first thing you want to do is install the buffer tube. I'm going to put a light coat of grease on this to insert it into the rear of the receiver and then thread it in there. Okay, got it started. Now you're going to drop the buffer retainer spring and plunger. That just drops in and then eventually you'll see in the next shot we'll go over that little edge there and keep that from flying out. Just like that, see? You'll see later what it's for. Before we slide the stock on, we want to put the spring in there that goes with that detent. So the spring goes in that hole in the back and then the stock retains it. There's also a takedown pin. I'll show you what that looks like installed. See that spring in the back? We're now going to insert the stock over the buffer tube. And you also want to be careful not to, like what we mentioned before, the spring, you don't want to kink it. This is really a two-hand operation. So you want to push the stock all the way to the end of the receiver and then make sure that spring's not kinked. A little spring does provide a little bit of pressure. So I need to hold it with one hand while I install the butt plate here and the bolt will retain the buffer and keep the stock hugged to the receiver. Well, that was pretty easy. The top one keeps the stock retained. The bottom one keeps a little sling loop on there. This is taking form now, isn't it? So basically I need to push this all the way through into the buffer tube. I put a light coat of oil on the main buffer spring there, and then you'll see what it looks like when it's totally retained. And that little nipple down there, if you will, retains the buffer. See, pretty cool, huh? We're going to install the upper receiver. What's nice is the fire control group was installed before, so that was kind of nice I didn't have to deal with that. No, you're not going to need the action block and the vise for this, but just for sake of an ease of filming, I did that. You can see I pulled the takedown pins back. There's two takedown pins. Short one in the rear, a little push pin that's captive. One in the front. You can see the holes in the upper that corresponds with the lower. I'll just set this on there. I had to put this the other way because my furnace got in the way of the the long upper. So we got the first one in there, it just sets in there, you push the pin in, and same with the rear. Push that in and look at that. 
you have an M16A1 married to, or well not married, but you know, just together at the moment with the AR15A2 lower. I did a function check off camera, works great. Just kind of cycling the action and checking out the trigger group function. There we go, it is complete. Got the classic 20 round Colt magazine in there as well. Got the other side. All we gotta do now is test fire the thing. I think I might have found a new bathroom gun. It'll also take 30 round magazines. I'll probably run mostly 20s though, just cause it's a classic one, but I'll still pop a 30 in there every once in a while. So the top buffer spring is the original one. It is within specification as far as length goes, but there's a little kink in the middle. And as you can see, it's not quite as long as a factory new Colt spring. So I'm gonna go ahead and might as well replace this. I haven't test fired it yet, but I might as well make, you know, it's just a spring, not that expensive, might as well replace it. And as far as the bolt rings, I almost said piston rings, but this gun does not use a piston. It is a direct impingement system, not a gas piston system. The rings, the, what do they call them? Gas rings, I guess would be correct. So the gas rings, to test that, you take a carrier and bolt assembly, and you set it down on a flat surface. And since it doesn't collapse, if you will, under gravity, you are good to go. See so if it were to do this by itself, that's when you know I have to replace the rings. But we don't have to in this case. Oh, hi buddy. Hi. What a good little boy, aren't you? Or a big boy, rather. Yeah. Oh, you've been a good kitty today, haven't you? You've been a good kitty, yeah. Be going to my parents' house today and we'll do a little shooting with the gun finally. See how she runs. That's right, buddy, huh? You gonna stay inside and keep an eye on the house for me while I'm gone, huh? Thank you. So right now, because of the election and COVID, and for several months now, ammunition prices have been absolutely crazy. So this happens every time there's something huge politically or a real life tragedy. So if there is a large mass shooting or something, there's always threat of legal changes, legislation, and that causes a price panic. A lot of new gun owners will come into the market and swoop everything up. A lot of people too will buy and resell just as sort of a capitalist means. And a lot of people just buy and hoard too. So you always are gonna need to keep a lot of extra ammo on hand, especially when it's cheap. The expression goes, buy it cheap and stack it deep. I always recommend people have a long-term stash where they never touch just to kind of keep sealed safely for a long time until an emergency situation where they need it. And then I also recommend people have, of course, naturally they would arrange a stash just for ammo to use for practice or recreation, whatever their purpose is. So right now, one, two, two, three, or 5.56 five, is just under a dollar. Sometimes it's more than a dollar, depending on the type. I was able to find some last night for like 87 cents a round, which is a tremendous amount of money for what it is. A year ago or so, quality brass case ammunition of this type was specifically the 5.56 five, or 2.23 was like 30 to 35 cents a round. Now it's just under a dollar, which is kind of funny because that's black market British prices. Generally, the black market in Great Britain, you can get one dollar will get you one round so we're approaching basically approaching black market prices in the lawful market which is kind of interesting but anyway that's why i'm not going to shoot a whole lot today just because i want to kind of save my what i have in my range stash for when i actually want to kind of open up you know have a little bit more fun and that right but isn't that crazy how things are right now they come and go this is temporary it may be for a while but it's it's generally temporary yeah depending on what happens
<laughs> Old school, huh? Retro, for sure. Yeah. Retro AR 15A2 slash M16A1 upper receiver. Check this out. This is the shell casing. And we have the brother recovered a bullet from the berm. How cool is that? Looks like it retained its weight pretty well. Yeah. Hey, buddy, you'll be pleased that weapon you wanted me to build has performed flawlessly. <laughs> yeah, I think he's pleased. Well, thank you all so much for joining us in this wonderful adventure. We'll talk to you later. I think he wants to go outside now. Bye-bye.